Welcome to Studio Korea and welcome to the Korea Society. I'm Stephen Harper, the Senior Vice President of the Korea Society, and we are delighted to have you here today. Uh, today we kick off our series on the media and perceptions of Korea, and we're very honored to have Paul Eckert from Reuters with us. Uh, Paul is a terrific mind on Asia. He is uh, someone who has dedicated the large share of his life to studying the Asia Pacific and the U.S. relationship with it. Uh, he's a graduate of the Fletcher School. He is fluent in uh, Mandarin, Korean, and Japanese. Uh, he is a truly unique uh, thinker and a very creative personality. Uh, he is in Washington with Reuters as an Asian correspondent, and he has uh, written uh, very wide and extensively on any range of issues affecting Asia. Uh, of late, that has included uh, issues uh, innate to Washington, uh, meaning the uh, government shutdown and issues related to that. Uh, the IMF meetings and Asia, uh, he just recently interviewed the South Korean finance minister, and uh, he's reported on issues uh, such as China, uh, India, uh, and uh, related interest. He uh, covered, I thought, in May uh, very nicely the uh, visit of uh, Park Geun-hye and her address uh, to Congress, and uh, we're very appreciative here of the Korea Society of that uh, as we try to educate Americans on uh, Korea and its realities. So, Paul, welcome. Thank you very much for being here at well, the thank Korea you. Society. And, uh, and uh, we're delighted to have all of you here in our, our studio audience. We welcome our online viewers and thank them as well. Uh, first and, and foremost, if I could open by uh, sort of asking you uh, about what drew you to Korea and uh, what drew you to Asia, your, your motivation on covering Asia, which you do so very well. Well, um, I first want to say I just came up from Washington, D.C. today, and uh, the government opened back up, and I have to share with you uh, the best Washington joke that I've heard during that period, and that is that finally, if you follow this, that there's been a lot of pressure on the Washington Redskins football team to change their name away from that. So finally, yes, the Washington Redskins changed their name. They dropped the Washington part because it's just so embarrassing. <laughs> Much loved by a New York audience. <laughs> exactly, your Giants fans. And it's not my original joke, but it's got, made the rounds. That's great. Um, but anyway, you know, oddly, uh, my, I graduated from high school in 1979. So you do the math, but... Um, for my age, but that was the year that we normalized relations with, uh, with the PRC, with China. And I was actually aspiring to be a photographer. I had already been the school photographer for several years, high school, uh, and I fancied myself, well, you know, go learn Chinese and become a photographer uh, for National Geographic and uh, take pictures of pandas and mountains and things. That was very simplistic kind of ambition that I had at the age of 16, 17. So when I attended university at Penn State, I, I took up Chinese. You had to take a language under the journalism program, but I was mainly thinking I'd become a photojournalist. And hmm. uh, uh, through language study, I ended up in Taiwan for a year, and I became very interested in geopolitics, politics. China was not yet really open to, to uh, people going there uh, yet, but uh, so I, you know, most people at that era learned their Chinese in Taiwan. Uh, so from there, uh, I was torn between, I had a journalism degree and an East Asian studies degree, but I was sort of torn between, be, do I become a scholar of political science or mm. go into journalism? That's what led me to meet you at the Fletcher School about a decade mm. later, eight, seven, eight years later. In between, I, I went out to Japan and uh, as part of the, what they now call the JET program, a uh, pretty well-known program of teaching English in various high schools. I was in rural Japan and uh, I managed to find a way to get economies of scale from Chinese characters, the written script of China, which mm -hmm. learning in Taiwan, you learn the old-fashioned script. It was very useful. Uh, and I took that into Japanese. And then, while I was still young, I decided, let's add Korean to that resume. Hmm. And there was good reasons to take a look at Korea. Uh, the 80s, this was, mid-80s. So you had a lot of political change. And they were having the Olympics in 1988. I was uh, started studying Korean language at the Yonsei University's uh, Language Institute, at that time, at least the, the best known and the best program. There may be others now since. And uh, in a sense, if you build the blocks of linguistically from learning the, the written Chinese, which is sort of the Latin of Northeast Asia, if you will, you have the vocabulary for Japanese. But Japanese also gives you the grammar, uh, the sentence structure and grammar that can carry you into, into Korean. And I thought, well, low-hanging fruit is kind of the idea. But there, there's economies of scale in learning those languages together or in, in sequence. And that's what I did. But, I'll, but probably what tipped the balance more than the Olympics is one of my mentors in life 
a uh, Romanian-Hungarian intellectual who studied with me at Penn State and spoke 23 languages. Mm -hmm. He married a Korean wow. graduate student uh, close to his age, and, and I got to meet her and her family, and they're just so warm and wonderful that that was the extra nudge into sort of making me curious about Korea. Mm -hmm. and that's back in, like, 1985. Mm -hmm. hey, and, and you went on, you actually worked uh, in Japanese press for a while, I believe. I did. Uh, right? uh, uh, it was... Uh, I told the young lady from Kyoto here, Kyoto News Agency, they were, uh, the year before the Seoul Olympics in 1988, hard mm -hmm. to believe 25 years ago, right about now, mm -hmm. uh, it was the Summer Olympics, but it took place sort of in October for the weather. And uh, the Japanese media sent a lot of their correspondents over to language school for training ahead of the games, because it was a big deal for them. And my fellow classmates, one of them was from Kyoto, he was a sports writer. Mm -hmm. So I became part of the, the sports writing team of Kyoto for, for just two months. No, fantastic. And I essentially... Didn't really use my Korean at the time, but I, as I, I interviewed some of the big athletes of the time, which included Edwin Moses and oh, Flo Jo, Flor the late Florence Griffith Joyner sure. and Carl Lewis and uh, Ben Johnson. I, I had the, Kyoto had a lot of reach and a lot of access, mm -hmm. and I was essentially an interpreter slash reporter. Mm -hmm. uh, they knew all the numbers. I was not a sports guy, especially an Olympic guy. They knew every, they were very detail-oriented on all the, the, the global records and everything like that. I, my job was purely linguistic, but it was just so fascinating. And I wrote a few stories in English for, for the Kyoto English Wire at the time. Oh, well, that's fantastic. And actually, the Korea Society in the spring is actually doing a kickoff on the road to Pyeongchang 2018. Oh, wow. And we're picking up the day after the close of the Sochi Games. Oh, excellent. And that's we're looking back at the 64 Tokyo Games. We're looking at the 1988 Seoul Games extensively, 2002 World Cup, and uh, then looking forward to uh, Pyeongchang 2018 Winter Games. Uh, and the just announced Tokyo 2020 Summer Games. Brilliant. So you, you, you have to bring Victor Chow in because you know, well, he's written a book about he's that. He's going to be with us. He's going to yeah. be with us on the 24th at noon yeah. here. So thank you for that. That's fantastic. We were there at, at really a seminal point, not only in terms of the Olympics, but the democratization process, mm -hmm. which must have really informed your thinking about Korea, which now is is a model for democracy yeah. and, and sustainability across the uh, Asia Pacific. I was on the campus of Yonsei, and again, as a language student, I wasn't a student at Yonsei, in 1987, when all those big changes of the demonstrations, uh, m like most Americans, your first taste of tear gas mm -hmm. was in Seoul. Sure. And what we, would, we would have our language classes from 9 in the morning till 1 p.m., and the curious uh, and the weak, or the curious that people, the, the demonstrations which built, were building up daily, we used to start after lunch in the afternoon, and if you were willing and able, had the time to stick around, they would, they would heat up by sort of three, four in the afternoon. And it was a set piece kind of thing with students on one side and throwing some stones and this and then, but eventually tear gas and uh, that sort of thing. And of course, a young, um, uh, a young student at Yonsei died in, in one of those exchanges. He's still widely recognized as sort of a martyr for the democracy movement. His name is Lee Han Yeol, I believe. There's still a famous picture of him. He, you know, basically what happened was the, the tear gas canisters were shot with a shot, well, basically a shotgun carrying, then carrying the canister. And, and they normally shot them kind of in an arc, but maybe in the heat of the moment, one came more directly and hit him in the head and, 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 and ruptured a blood vessel. And he, he, he basically had to, some sort of, he went into a coma and he passed away. But uh, I remember that I didn't see that particular, I was at that demo, but once the tear gas starts flying, you just, they, you know, you, you really you panic and you uh, you can't breathe and you feel like you're gonna throw up and you know it's a scary time so we sort of clear out but the diehard uh, the students uh, you know f used to fight it out day in and day out during that period and I was actually pessimistic because uh, I thought they would not give in on the central point um, and it was a log jam not unlike we saw in Washington but sort of fought out both mm -hmm in the streets. It was whether they were going to have a parliamentary system or a presidential system, how they were going to elect the successor to Chun Du Huan. I do think that the pressure of the Olympics a year out mm -hmm. uh, was w was brought to bear on the, the sort of sense of Korea's sense of its international image. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure there was some, some helpful pressure or whatever you want to call it from allies and, and people who cared about Korea, but they, they ended up making the right decision. And uh, almost immediately things went back to normal, and uh, that's real K Korean history in the last oh, quarter sure. century. Oh, sure, and, yeah. and, and here we are now, 25, almost almost uh, 30 years on, uh, and uh, we see uh, a dramatically different Korea, a Korea that uh, not only weathered uh, the recession, uh, but managed to leap out at the fore and, and do a very good job, better than, than many more developed countries, mm -hmm. uh, one that has... Uh, 
figured very largely in the OECD that has been a host uh, and a hub. Uh, and uh, your coverage of, of uh, Park Geun-hye and her historic visit uh, with Obama uh, really presents Korea and all of its modern face in 2013. How do you look at Korea today? Well, I like to uh, look at Korea as uh, one of the relatively rare countries, if you consider of a generation of countries that came out of the, you know, the, the ashes of World War II and then in its own case the ashes of the Korean War and was, you know, a tiger economy but escaped the so-called middle income trap that people grapple with. People wonder wh whether China is going to reach a certain level and then stagnate for whatever reason. And Korea basically had a lot of st speed bumps on its road to success and tended to plow right through them and uh, learn its lessons and get back up. I, my time as a correspondent for Reuters in Seoul was 2001 mm. to 2004, another epical time in Korea with the sunshine policy, with President Kim Dae-jung winning the Nobel Peace Prize. But before he won the Peace Prize, remember, he was the person who was able to engineer a uh, recovery from the uh, financial crisis, and, and, and Korea paid back the money it owed the IMF. I remember the day because mm -hmm. uh, you know it was they paid it up. They paid it back well ahead of time. It was a matter of pride and principle. They didn't need to pay it back as quickly as they did, but they could and they did. And uh, it was the kind of thing that you know doesn't make world headlines. Oh, Korea pays it back, but within Korea, it was a very uh, psychologically and emotionally uh, important moment. I think that that Korea you know t turned a you know sort of uh, defied the doubters and turned things around and uh, you know went ahead to the next level of development. Mm -hmm. And so when you sit down, as you did last week at the IMF meeting with the South Korean finance minister, you know, how does, uh, how, how do you as a reporter with great experience kind of go into it? What do you think about how do you approach a, a, a person like that and how do you well, approach Korea today? We're uh, writing for a world audience that leans heavily towards the financial side of, mm -hmm. of the world and the issues that were happening at the time included the U.S., the, less the government shutdown, which that's a more domestic affair, but the looming, you know, the, the, the way it worked, the, the calendar worked over the last two weeks since the Ted Cruz filibusters, or whatever you want to call the speeches, it sort of was a, a case of the, you know, the, the, the shutdown was an earlier sort of, if you will, foreplay for then the eventual def potential default. So the focus at the IMF whereas they would have wanted to talk about the global economy, the U.S. became the issue right here in Washington on one end, one end of Pennsylvania, because the World Bank IMF, they're on Pennsylvania Avenue, another couple blocks uh, you know, west of the White House, and then you had the White House, and then you had the other end, you had Capitol Hill being dysfunctional. So it, it, that was the cloud that hung over it. So I asked him questions about that sort of thing and what you thought, uh, what he thought about it. And, you know, he, he was a polite, uh, you know, government official diplomat. He didn't really want to jump into the domestic politics in the United mm -hmm. States, because that doesn't generally go well for, for statesmen, but more like can Korea endure and, you know, what, what are the losses, what are the exposure? Most of the Asian countries that I cover uh, most closely are the, also the, the big holders of treasury bills, because that's where they mm -hmm. recycle, that's where they deposit their, their foreign reserves that they build up. And again, you know, Korea, it's, it, seems, it seems like a lifetime ago, but the Asian financial crisis, it was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the memories are deep from that period, and, and the IMF was deeply, you know, involved in Korea's, and it wasn't, you know, it was an unpleasant experience for for Korea. Remember, IMF. There used to be protesters back that time. I am fired, and people would say things <laughs> like sure. that. If you remember that, so uh, basically, I asked him about how Korea was coping, and you know, essentially, most of the even you know the pro-U.S. sort of officials, but China and others, they all voiced confidence that the U.S. with a little nudge, you know. Mm. I, we're sure that you have the wisdom to sort this out. There was mm -hmm. empathy for, I think there was empathy for Jack Lew that mm -hmm. I heard from the Indians, from the Chinese, from, uh, from, other, from other countries, from, from, from uh, Finance Minister Hyun. Sure. Uh, let, let, let's shift it just a little bit, but, but still in that same vein, um, if, if you could share, especially with a New York audience and an online audience from, from very different regional areas, uh, what happens in Washington in terms of the way that it thinks about Asia from the perspective of, of you as a professional journalist and how does that dialogue on Asia occur and what is the back and forth between the media and government? Mm. Well, uh, it's complex. Uh, the thing is, uh, you know, the, the, uh, you, your top officials here at the Korea Society are 
former diplomats who've mm -hmm. worked with Korea, both within the State Department or, and in the embassies, and worked more, more broadly in their career. Uh, I worked under uh, Mark Mitten as an intern mm -hmm. at the, on the Japan desk in 1990. I still have fond memories of his crisp professionalism and his quick mind. And, not just flattering my host, but that's my memory. <laughs> Very of it. good. Um, and Tom Hubbard, Ambassador Hubbard, he was my ambassador during my tenure. In uh, sure. he arrived in Seoul to start his job on 9/11, 2001. Mm -hmm. Yeah, never forget that. Uh, the you know the Asia people do their thing no matter what, and they're not as distracted as you'd think by other things. The headline, the zeitgeist, if you will, uh, shifts, and it's heavily on Syria. I spent the summer and m much of the summer where the the main story was had nothing to do with me. It was Syria. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, the, all the toing and froing in Syria, the, the dealings with Russia, the G20 that way. The, you know, Asia felt neglected. Uh, I mean, they might have felt neglected, but, you know, the professionals who, who do their jobs, they do it time in and time out. You know, it, it's important to note that uh, Danny Russell, who uh, is, you know, the, the, the Assistant Secretary for East Asia and Pacific, he was the first of the new team under John Kerry to be confirmed through the Senate. So, and he's, he was already over at the White House working the Asia profile, so he hit, hit the ground running mm -hmm. quite well. So it's not as if, you know, there's a walk and chew gum element to everything that's done in, 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 um, on the government side. I keep chipping away at what I do, uh, which the, it's a portfolio that can include Nepal on the odd occasion. Uh, you know, and sometimes, you know, there was a, a plane went down in Laos uh, mm -hmm. overnight and tourists, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes even that little stuff comes my way. But uh, my 80% of my job is working on China, and we had this summer, uh, you know, we had an, a meeting in California with, between the leaders in an informal summit, a very significant in terms of style and new way of getting along with China, getting on with China. And we had a annual uh, strategic and economic talks. So in that sense, you know, the world, there's a bigger world, and there's a, always this, you know, it's the urgent versus the important. Mm -hmm. And I like to say I'm, I'm more on the important than the urgent, because mm -hmm. the urgent is the headline stuff. Sure. Now, when it came to the government shutdown, uh, that was a, there was a significant Asian angle there. It was the government shutdown also prevented uh, President Obama from going out to the region for two sure. important summits where mm -hmm. everyone else was there. There was general understanding of his circumstances, but you know the, the optics weren't great for for the U.S. during that period. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the default down to the brink. That that sort of thing has, you know, ramifications. Uh, going forward, I mean, bad optics, soft a soft power hit. In the United States, we can recover from that. But, you know, we haven't really solved the problem. So that uncertainty, the last thing the world wants, and this probably is true of even North Korea, you know, they, they want the counterfeit bills that they produce to have the full value of the United States. I'm joking. But, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, sorry. But, uh, you know what I mean? They, but the point is that every stakeholder, everyone holds dollars. Until mm -hmm. that changes, we can't behave like some reckless teenager uh, you know, playing games, we're, we're playing games with other people's money, other sure. people's savings, uh, you know, the it, it, elementary finance, or the, the treasuries are the bedrock of how the interest rates, the mortgage rates you pay, but everything. So, you know, savings are being played with in, in a sort of a political kabuki that the, the details of which you don't understand when you live in Chengdu, perhaps, but it affects you. So, you know, that, that sort of thing, you should sure. be aware of that. We may get back to some of that in, in the audience Q&A, and, and, and let me just wrap up our, our, our discussion between the two of us with, with sort of two questions then. Uh, one is, is on the issue of China, which you say takes you know, about 80% of your time. On December 13th, uh, we at the Korea Society are hosting representatives from China, Korea, and the United States to talk about that emerging trilateral reality, especially on the a heel six months later of the uh, meetings uh, between Obama and Pak, uh, Obama and Xi in Sunny Lands, as you mentioned, and then uh, Pak and Xi in mm -hmm. Beijing. And uh, so I'd like to know a, a little bit of your thought looking at it in terms of how Korea navigates China and the United States. Uh, and then the North Korea question, because you, you did just allude to that and, and how North Korea figures, especially for you and for Reuters. Well. The uh, when we cover these summits uh, and these high-level meetings, the notion, which is a Washington slang word, of deliverables, is always comes up. And what are they? And uh, they always, you know, U.S. officials will play down like this is more of a. I'm, I'm talking about Sunnylands, a mood-setting um, kind of exercise, and mm -hmm. get to know this man who's going to run China for ten years. 
he's a man with a certain track record in the United States. And uh, the, but as it turns out, you know, a better degree of agreement and sort of accord on dealing with North Korea came out of Sunnylands. It was the one thing that Thomas Donilon highlighted the most. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you dug around behind the scenes that there was some substance to it. I mean, they're always going to put the best gloss on a meeting, but there is a sense that uh, China, there's a recognition down in Washington that China's interests and the U.S. interests on North Korea don't entirely, they're never going to entirely in align because they share a border with North Korea, and there's a history as well. Uh, there's a cultural history that goes back th hundreds to thousands of years, but there's also a political history of 60-odd years. But there's more of that proximity to the border and the stability, <laughs> the refugees, all of that sort of thing. Uh, so there's always going to be, you know, China's, China's uh, role as a stakeholder is widely recognized and respected. And I do think that, you know, it's sort of, it's not sort of China is moving towards our position and we want to, we consider, it's not zero sum. In other words, there's a give and take, I think, but there is a lot more of a meeting of the minds. I, I know for a fact, just a week ago, on the, right ahead of the IMF, uh, down at uh, Johns Hopkins, Sice, Ambassador Tsui, the new Chinese ambassador, relatively new Ch Chinese ambassador in Washington, who was at the six party talks uh, five years ago. He was one of the representatives. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's an America hand, but he's a, a veteran uh, of the Chinese foreign ministry. And he's Sice educated, speaks excellent English, has a good sensibility. Uh, he, when he listed his priorities, uh, uh, China's priorities on North Korea, he put no nukes first, which that would be considered movement by all, most of the North Korea watchers. Now, again, there's, there's an asterisk there that they, you know, for regime change, obviously has gotten a bad name after over the last 10 years. And I'm not a, like an out and out advocate of regime change. Uh, and China would hate that notion, but but basically the change of behavior and that sort of thing. The point is that they've moved away from letting, winking at the nuclear program and, 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 and stability at all costs, even including up to winking at the nuclear program, <laughs> to something a bit more serious. And to be fair to China, they have signed on to m nearly all of the sets of new UN sanctions that have come up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, come up since the nuclear tests of 2009 and uh, earlier this year, the February test. China signed on. They, they you know, they've, they fought, <laughs> they fought North Korea's corner a little bit. They took some of the sharper edges off some of the sanctions, uh, but they didn't sort of, they didn't do what Russia did for Syria. They didn't obstruct. They, mm -hmm. they let it go through, and it was a signal. And I think that uh, they've also not really yet been willing to give Kim Jong-un and his people the, the face time that, that Pyongyang probably wants because they're showing their displeasure. I think that they felt snubbed by the, um, mm. you know, their own good offices were, were not repaid by the, by the, uh, by the Kim Jong-un administration. Mm, very interesting. Paul, Paul, if I can ask you in closing then, what, what are your thoughts about trust politic under Pakane and, and your thoughts maybe about uh, integration and eventual unification on the peninsula? Mm. I, we haven't really had enough uh, time to see trust politic in action. Again, not for one of trying from Seoul. You know, we have the early bits of it. Uh, but, you know, Kaesong is only sort of sputtering to a reopening, and that's sort of one instrument of, you know, the outreach. Uh, you have to credit Pak Geun-hye for so softening the edges of her predecessor's policy, which was based on principles you can understand after what happened in 2010. And also, you know, the sense, at least from the conservative side of, of Korean society, that, uh, that Seoul, was, Seoul was being taken advantage of and, and you know, belittled, uh, you know, the 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 arrangements, whether it was the the, the Kim Gong San tourist uh, uh, park and those kind of they they were sort of the benefits were one sided to 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 uh, North Korea, which over in a short term you can tolerate, but eventually some degree of reciprocity has to to you know for political support some degree of reciprocity has to be shown, not kind like like for like, but more you know. Uh, that North Korea is going to sort of calm down a little bit, and they never did, really. Mm. Well, well, thank you, Paul. And we do want to leave some time here for the members of our studio audience to interact with you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, this evening's uh, uh, banner uh, featured Edward R. Murrow and, and the troops uh, in Korea, and he was there at that time with mm -hmm. the largest uh, international media delegation covering the Korean War. Uh, but we saw that, one, as a nod to our Korean War veterans whom we honored this summer. Uh, but Very two, nice. uh, you know, to you for really... 
uh, all of your tremendous work uh, and really continuing in that lineage of, of very fine professional journalism and as the Korea Society sits at the nexus of the finance and journalist communities here in New York City uh, as well as the United Nations. We're very honored to have you in and we're very honored to be able to lead off our series on Korea and media perceptions with you. So thank you for your time today and uh, please if you could help me in thanking Paul Eckert from Thomson Reuters. <laughs>